down to our last two messages here as we journey through the Psalms. This is our Bible project. I want to say hello again to all those who are watching this through our YouTube channel. And again, we want to specifically welcome Ty and Amanda from Labrador City as they are hosting a journey house group up in Labrador City, and they're watching these messages on a regular basis. So again, hello, Ty and Amanda. And again, hello to everyone else who's watching this, whether near or far. Or maybe you're watching this because you're now at your cottage and you're not coming into the service. Well, I want to say hello to you. Um, again, as we continue our journey, um, to, we've been going through a lot of what we think are real life issues, because this series is called Real Help for Real People. And today, we want to talk about another issue that we've been um, wanting to address, and we want to call it, um, well, it's, it's kind of a tough word that we don't really are comfortable with, and it's called the adulterer. We've looked at the discouraged, we've looked at the suffering, we've looked at the aging, we've looked at the young, but now we want to raise another one and ask the question about the adulterer. Now, do we have that clip um, I got, I, I, one of my favorite um, short cartoon clips I've, I've seen over the years is, anyone seen that clip of that squirrel always chasing the nut? It's, he's, his name is Scrat, and um, he's always going after the nut. Well, let's just watch a clip of that, just for a moment. The question I always have after I watch that squirrel go after his nut is I wonder to myself, what have I made in my life the nut that I'm constantly chasing, that I'm always frantic to get possession of? Um, in other words, what have I made as ultimate, or what has, what has truly captured my heart? Um, if you're following along the outline uh, today, uh, the question that we have here is, in other words, what is the central message of my life? If, if someone was to say, well, this is really what Dave is all about. This is really what has captured his heart, his attention. What, what would it be? And, and if someone was to look at you and, and say, you know, really, this is what they really value. At the end of the day, this is what shapes them. You know, what is the central message of your life? You know, there are a lot of different messages out there in the world today that people let their lives be shaped by. I mean, we, we live in a culture, right, that has a lot of different messages that say, this is what matters the most, this is what is ultimate, this is what you need to chase after, just like Scrat does after that nut, and give it your very best. Well, we, you know, as uh, we were looking at what are some of those messages in our, our culture, well, here's a few of them. Winning, first of all, matters the most. I mean, you know, we, 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 we talk about, oh, it doesn't matter if you win, but you know what? It amazes me how excited parents get when their kids win. It amazes me how excited companies get when they have great profits. It amazes me how, how winning, at the end of the day, even though we try to be coy about it, we really do say winning matters the most. That's what keeps jobs. That's all about productivity. You know, we love to see the, the graph always up and to the right. You know, another message out there that people can get focused in on is they really say to themselves, at the end of the day, I have to make it happen. It really depends upon me. 
Yes, you know, we, we, we can depend upon others. You can pray. We can, we can, you know, pretend. But at the end of the day, if things are going to happen, I have to make those things happen. You know, another message out there, one that really has gripped our culture, which is a central message for a lot of people's lives, is this. My happiness is essential. I mean, I've met um, marriages in trouble, and what makes them in trouble is that one person says, well, I'm not happy anymore. And that is the game changer for them. They say, I'm not happy anymore. Therefore, my happiness is essential. Everything else takes second place. You know, th th that happiness is essential idea can affect um, life choices, can affect um, so many different things where, where people say, if I'm not happy then, well, obviously, I need to make changes. Regardless of else who gets hurt or disappointed or discouraged or destroyed along the way. You know, another central message that's out in our culture is that money, sex, and power are really great. I mean, really, some um, thinkers and writers say that, really, when you boil down to what people get focused in on for their entire life, it really comes down to those three key areas. We spend all our days, you know, either thinking or worrying about money, we, or we're, we're thinking about sex, or we're thinking about power. Where do we have power? And that's really all that matters. How, if we have lots of it, of those three things, then life's great. And what's wrong with that? You know, another, another central message of our lives is that my family is everything. My family is is everything, matters the most. Um, and uh, I wonder we have, did that come up yet? I guess it didn't. All right, well, anyway, don't worry about it. You can add that to the dot list. My family is everything. It's on the outline, I believe. And, and again, um, one, of the, one of the dynamics of that, of that idea is that, you know, at the end of the day, Whatever else matters, again, takes second place to my children and to my family. You know, as we think about what has captured your heart, um, I, I came across um, some statements by Timothy Keller in his book, Counterfeit Gods, in which he talks about idolatry. And um, I just want to read a couple of his quotes from his book. It's a great book to read, Counterfeit Gods. And this is what he writes. He says, when anything in life is an absolute requirement for your happiness and self-worth, it has essentially become an idol. C can, I, can I stress that again? If when anything in life is an absolute requirement for your happiness and sense of self-worth, then that thing has essentially become an idol, something you are actually worshiping. And, and you know this thing has become an idol when whatever that is is threatened, your anger becomes absolute. Your anger is actually the way that idol keeps you in its service, in its chains. Therefore, if you find that despite all the efforts to forgive, your anger and bitterness cannot subside, you may need at that moment to look deeper and ask this question. What am I so upset about? What am I defending? Why am I so angry? What is so important that I cannot live without? And it may be until that desire of what you have turned into an idol is identified and confronted, you will not be able to master your anger. I mean, and I just want to highlight this to you. Whatever you really, really get angry about and upset about, that's probably a, an insight about, is, has that captured my heart? Okay. Here, here's another um, couple, just really shorter quotes by him in this book. He says, if you marry someone, expecting them to be like a God, meeting all your needs, it's in inevitable that they will disappoint you. It's not that you should try to love your spouse less, but rather you should know and love God more. And then finally he says, what many people call psychological problems are simply issues of idolatry. Perfectionism, workaholism, chronic indecisiveness, the need to control the lives of others, 
all of these stem from making good things into idols that then drive us into the ground as we try to appease them. Idols dominate our lives. And I really want you to just highlight that idea that he said at the end there. Often, it isn't bad things that we turn into idols. It's good things that we turn into idols that capture our ultimate allegiance and we make them the center of our security and sense of self-worth. And what are those good things? Well, like, money has a, a good, you know, thing. It, it meets our needs. But if money becomes our sense of self-worth, then greed has become our idolatry. If, if we made our families the center of our security and self-worth, then our families have become our idol. And we're saying, you have to make me feel secure and loved and needed all the time. And we can get, turn into, you know, control freaks. So again, we have to ask ourselves, how do we break free from those things that would capture the center of our hearts and move to that place that only God himself deserves. Well, I want to, again, just turn to um, Psalm 95, and I want to just read, again, the first part of that passage. And we're reminded of something here about who God is. Ardith did a great job in the worship leading in reading this, but I want to just read it again. It's, it, it's worth hearing again. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The seas belong to him, for he made it. His hands formed the dry land too. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. You know, the psalmist here is helping us to do a couple of things at, at, uh, up in the front of this uh, psalm, in these first seven verses. He's first of all saying, there's a reason to rejoice, people. We are in the presence of God. The Lord, he is a great God. He's a great king. And that is a reason to rejoice. And then he tells us not only that we are called to rejoice, but he says, this is why we need to be able to rejoice. He gives us reasons for it. He says, you know, God made us. He's our maker. He's our God. He watches over us. We are like, he's the shepherd and, and, and we are his flock. You know, the scriptures reveal here in the Psalms that God is the ultimate reality. You know, I, I can't help but think about the horror that happened this past week at that Methodist Episcopal Church. I can't, I can't, I can't fathom it. The evil is overwhelming. But what this scripture tells me is this, as overwhelming that evil is, God is bigger still. God is greater yet. And that gives me hope. You know, as we, as we think about, about this passage, one of the things that this, this psalm, as so many other psalms, move us towards is it says, where is your view? Are you looking beyond the obvious? You know, as we, as we think about this, um, you know, Brent and I, as we were putting this outline together, we said, you know, what is so hard for so many people is that you have what we call the obvious, you know, the small r reality of life coming at us all the time. We have jobs, we have work, we have family, we have activities, we have goals, we have projects, we have all these things coming at us. And so it's easy to get caught up and say, well, this is all that really matters. And we forget about what lies beyond. You know, I, we were sort of thinking, in a, it was a, a sobering illustration for us, but we were thinking about, um, you know, in that horrific tsunami that, you know, hit in, you know, Indonesia and, and, and that part of the world, you know, that number of years ago. Um, you know, what was obvious to all those people playing on the beach? Because we saw a video, right? What was obvious initially? 
Well, the only thing that was obvious was that the water had gone out. That, that was all that was obvious. That was the only thing they were aware of. In fact, there was video, you, you know, you, you can go on YouTube and watch this. They show kids and, you know, adults, they're running around picking up all these shells that now that the water had been sucked out. And, and they're thinking, this is a great moment. And, and in that moment, they were simply living in what was obvious, what was in front of them. What they didn't know was that within the next hour, there would be a mountainous wave coming at them um, that would smash into the coastline of that part of the world, obviously killing hundreds of thousands of people. And I guess for us, you know, we, we live in a world sometimes where people, so many people, just live what's in, in front of them. They're, they're busy picking up the shells of life. They're just saying, yeah, the water's gone out. That's where they are. And they don't ask the question, what is coming next? You know, as I, as I think about the psalm here, it is again a reminder to say, let's remember who's ultimately in control. Let us remember who is the ultimate reality. God is bigger than whatever comes our way. In fact, what the psalmist is reminding us is that God is present all the time, and all the time, God is present. You know, I was, I was reading um, about that comedian, uh, Ricky uh, G- Gervais, um, who has done a variety of comedy, but he has come out and declared that he's an atheist. And, and I realized that I thought, you know, Ricky is, is that part of our culture now that we have to engage as, as people of faith. Because Ricky talks about what, when he, the moment he became an atheist. This is what he says. I used to believe in God, the Christian one, that is. I loved Jesus. He was my hero. But one day, I was sitting at the kitchen table when my brother came home. He was 11 years older than me at the time, so he would have been about 19, and I was 8 years of age. He was as smart as anyone I knew, but he was also cheeky. He would answer back and get into trouble. I was a good boy. I went to church, and I believed in God. What a relief for my working-class mother. I was happily drawing my hero Jesus when my big brother Bob asked, Why do you believe in God? Just a simple question, but my mom panicked. Bob, she said in a tone that I knew meant shut up, Why was that a bad thing to ask? If there was a God and my faith was strong, it didn't matter what people said. Oh, hang on. There is no God. My brother knows it, and my mom knows it deep down. It was as simple as that. And I started thinking about it and asking more questions, and within an hour, I was an atheist. Wow, no God. If mom had lied to me about God, had she also lied to me about Santa? Yes, of course, but who cares? The gifts keep coming, and so do the gifts of my newfound atheism, the gifts of truth and science and nature and the real beauty of this world. I no longer needed a reason for my existence. I just needed a reason to live. And for me, imagination, free will, love, humor, fun, music, sports, beer, and pizza are all good enough reasons to live. You know, that's the world we live in right now. We live in a world where for some people, those are the only reasons they need to live. And yet I would come back to them and say, but is that a foundation that is going to help you really face life? For the moment, maybe, while the water's gone out and you're picking up the shells, but what about when the tsunamis come? Is that the foundation that will hold you fast? You know, as we think about what is the central message of our life, the question I want to leave with us tonight is this. Does my life, does your life show that I believe God is the great king above all gods? It's interesting here, and again, this is where you have to know the Bible story in a broader way to really get the sense of what the psalmist is saying here in this latter part of the psalm, because listen to what he says. He says, if only you would listen to his voice today. The Lord says, don't harden your hearts as Israel did at Meribah, as they did at Massa in the wilderness. For there your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw everything I did. And for 40 years I was angry with them, and I said, they are a people whose hearts turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. 
And so my anger, I took an oath. They'll never enter my place of rest. You know, the challenge here when we read this is we've got to ask ourselves a quick question. What's Meribah and Massa? <laughs> like, what's all that about? Well, actually, it's when you go back into the story of the Exodus, when the people of Israel had been freed from Egypt and Moses was leading them. Well, guess what happened? Just after they got through the Red Sea and, you know, and, you know all the big explosion there of water, and they, they made it through in dry land, and, and the Egyptian soldiers were, you know, washed away in judgment by God and all that. Well, they started to travel through the desert. God was starting to lead them. And guess what they started to do? They started to complain. They started to grumble against Moses, against Aaron. And, then, and, and, and that's when we read the stories about God providing them quail and God providing them manna. But then in Exodus 17, they, God had led them to a place called Repetim, And there they started complaining, saying, we need water. And so God um, said to Moses, well, you know, go out and strike this rock and the water will come forth. But but the question they started to yell out to God, they they moved from complaining against Moses and Aaron and they started to say, God, are you among us or not? Are you with us or not? And God said, you are testing me. Now what's wild is that God was also testing them to say, in this moment of testing and trial, will you trust me to know that I'm trustworthy, that I will care for you, as it says here, we are the people he watches over. Or will you start to ask, which they did start to ask, God, are you among us or not? You know, this is the warning You know, later on, Moses in Deuteronomy would say, don't forget about Massa and Meribah because that's where you tested God. And by testing him, you were saying, God, are you really trustworthy? It's fascinating that Jesus, when he was being tempted by Satan in the desert in the New Testament, you go in, in the temptations of Jesus. The last temptation was Satan says, go up to this highest pinnacle, throw yourself off, and let God's angels catch you. And Jesus says, Scripture says, you shall not test the Lord your God. And guess what he was referring to? He was referring to this incident in Exodus 17, where the people had tested God. Because Jesus says, I know my Father's trustworthy. I don't need to test them. You know, as we stop and ask ourselves this, often the reason why our hearts gravitate to those other messages of culture, winning is everything. Money, sex, and power are great. My family is everything. It's because we have failed to really say God is trustworthy. We have to make a choice. Is that, which one are we really going to put our hearts into and let our hearts be captured by? You see, the life question you have to ask yourself, just the way the Israels asked the question, is the Lord here with us or not? What's your answer? If he's with us, then he's trustworthy because he's a great God. He is the rock of our salvation and we can trust him. You know, we all face moment after moment in our journey through life at times where we feel like we're in a wilderness where we need to ask what has captured our hearts and it's not that we are to love good things less please understand that god has given us some wonderful gifts but but what we need to ask ourselves is do we know and love god more in our hearts do we know that god is trustworthy that his ways are good and just and lead to life You know, when we look at the story here of Israel, as it's referred to in Psalm 95, we see that Israel was not in the wilderness by accident. God had led them there. And neither is it an accident when life pushes hard at us believers today. We can, if we choose, to interpret our troubles as evidence of God's indifference, and we would be wrong. I mean, we need to worship and bow down. The Lord is our maker. He is our God. We are the people he watches over. See, God loves us. 
And he uses, I believe, our troubles to confront us with the spiritual issues we would rather ignore. And the question simply becomes this. Who are you going to trust in the midst of your troubles? Are you going to trust in yourself? Are you going to trust in those messages from our culture? Or will you trust in God? I love this phrase here in the Psalms. It says, don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. But instead, open your heart to the very presence of God and let his rule of love in Christ rule your heart so that you will be able to say, for the Lord is our great God. He's a great king above, above all the other gods that this culture may throw at us. So come, let us worship and let us bow down. Let us live in the reality that the Lord is our maker. We are his people. He watches over the flock under his care. Let's pray. Lord, Jesus, you say to seek first the kingdom of God. Wow. Lord, that means that we need to seek God's rule in our life. We need to seek his way, the way of love and of sacrifice and of grace and of truth. So Lord, we would just simply pray that you would allow our hearts to be captured by your love. And out of that love, it would change our hearts from its very depths so that then our choices would simply reflect that you rule us and that we are your people and we know that you are our great king, the rock of our salvation. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.